probably our most popular. Like when we talk about getting uh, Josh on the show, people go crazy. Uh, also, one of the nicest guys in the business, in a, in a business with people who are not like talkative. This dude will talk to you in a press box on the sidelines. He'll answer your tweets. He's great. Josh Pate joining us here on the Brian Foley Law Hotline. Josh, what's up, man? What else do we have to do, David? It's not like we're working four other side jobs. This is kind of it. It's never made sense to me not to talk about this. You know what? I have found, you and I have talked about this privately before. I have found that not everyone who covers college football loves college football. Somehow that's a reality. And those are the ones who don't tend to be talkative. You don't have to worry about that with either of us, though. What I love about you is that you're, uh, and I try to do this, you're unapologetically you, right? You got to take, that's what, you know, you, you don't cater. You tell people the way you see it. And you've had a, a vision for AM football that you have maintained and you've stayed with it. And uh, I love that, that you present your case and you stick with it. And then if you want to alter it, you, you give your reasons for altering it. So where are you on the state of AM's football program considering financially what they committed to Jimbo and what's ahead and, and maybe the potential candidates out there? Yeah. So let's just set this entire scene. I have thought for a long time that a and is one of the best jobs in the country. Okay. As you guys know, you're experiencing this right now. You cannot have a rational conversation with a vast majority of the college football public about this because they don't possess the ability to distinguish the difference between program and job. And so even the ones who try to, I have found, end up on some kind of backwards logical island of, well, maybe A&M's got a lot of money, but that doesn't make it a good job. Yes, it does. It absolutely does. The only difference between the big boys out there who have great programs, elite programs, and A&M is not that A&M possesses the money, but not the know-how. They possess the money, which is the name of the game in this sport, and they haven't made the right hire. I grew up in Georgia. So for a long time, I mean, my entire adolescence and young adulthood in Georgia, they said that about Georgia. They said, well, yeah, they've got a lot of money up there, but Georgia doesn't know how to win. They don't know how to have a top program. So maybe it's a good, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rich program, but it's not, a, it's not ever going to be a top tier job. Well, then they hired Kirby and nothing about the past mattered. They hired Kirby Smart and it didn't matter that the last title they had won was before I was born. He started winning and then he won one and then he won another one. And they're, they're in contention to win a third. All of a sudden, those people disappeared. And my contention is, what if AM had hired Kirby Smart? Like, what if, what if he was there? I have no doubt. I'm talking zero doubt that they'd be doing the exact same thing in College Station that they are in Athens. There is no limitation there. So anyway, I've been having this argument ad nauseum with people all over the country. And I can't believe it's an argument. There are some things I say sometimes that I will grant you are a little out there, even if I do believe them. This is not out there. To me, it's out there or it's radical to suggest the AM job is not one of the best in the country. I've yet to hear any kind of remotely convincing argument to the contrary. So where, where's the program? The program is at a place where uh, they've got talent acquisition figured out as one of the best recruiters in the country. Resource wise, of course, all the boxes are checked. It is a turnkey winner. The moment you get the right guy in there, it won't take three years. It's not, it's not an FSU rebuild. It is a let's get to work immediately. And maybe one year, if you need cultural overturn or you got a guy that needs to get his guys on the roster, it, it is pedal to the floor. I think immediate contender for the right guy. Uh, that is as good an opportunity, as good a landing spot as you could ever have this side of what Kirby actually inherited at Georgia. Because that, that, well, that was a sweet landing that he had there. Ryan Day inherited a great situation. Whoever gets AM is right on par with that. Josh, is it fair to say that Jimbo was the right guy until he wasn't? It would be hypocritical for me to say no, because I thought the hire was good at the time. I praised the hire. Um, I'm not a big believer in, you know, praising something. And then, you know, when it doesn't work, trashing it because an AD doesn't get to do that. An AD makes the hire and has to live with the hire. Um, same reason I don't question play calling a lot. Everybody's a genius after the play happens about what was supposed to be called. So, yeah, it may be right. And I also... I've I've been over on the Texags boards and I've seen some folks say, well, this decision should have been made one year ago or two years ago. Well, two years ago, that would be ludicrous. Even one year ago, 
I just don't think it's reasonable to have said that. In, in a no consequence environment, yeah, you can do it. It's like Xbox. You can just press reset and start over. That's not the world we live in. Um, so yeah, I celebrated the hire when it happened. It ran its course. Uh, I think also, David, we're not nearly at this point, but at Clemson, maybe they're approaching having this conversation too. Now, granted, he won two titles at Clemson, whereas, whereas Jimbo didn't win one. But there, there was a way of doing things that was very advantageous in the mid-20-teens that is not so advantageous now. It's an apples to oranges because Dabo's problems are not necessarily Jimbo's problems and vice versa. But the key overarching point remains the same. There was an inability or unwillingness to change. And I'm speaking past tense at AM because Jimbo's gone. There is that presently to a certain extent at Clemson. Maybe we're watching that play rinse and repeat itself a couple of hundred miles over to the east. So it's it's not a it's not a theme that was born at Texas A and M. We've seen that before. We'll see it again elsewhere in college football. So that may be an accurate way to categorize it. As an Aggie, I feel like there's no no brainer out there, right? Because you thought you had the no brainer with Summy, and and because I thought he was a great hire when they hired him, and he had an amazing start. I thought you had a no brainer with Jimbo, and I still was holding on to what Jimbo was up until I don't know. Sometime around the App State game, I started doubting, but like it, it was definitely this season where I certainly got off the train. So, like, who is the guy? Like, if if money is an obstacle, it is because of what you have to pay for Jimbo. But like, is there a guy that you're like, man, you put that guy there outside of Nick Saban and Kirby Smart, like that will make this program a national championship caliber team? No, there's not. There's not the surefire guy. Landing would be that. I don't think Landing's coming there. I have. I have. I have a way of looking at coaches where I don't just look at the potential reward. You have to look at the potential risk. It is one of the absolute blind spots in this entire uh, kind of season of coaching hires. Everybody gets drunk on the reward and you, you just totally turn your back on the risk. Lanning's a high risk, low reward guy, uh, but I think he's staying at Oregon. That's my thought at least. So I look elsewhere I really, you cannot, to me at least, you cannot have a guy like John Summerall at Troy in the conversation. He doesn't have enough mileage, doesn't have enough um, experience. He is a guy down the road that I think will be a rock star head coach for someone. Glenn Schumann at Georgia is a guy who only knows the Bama way and the Georgia way, the Saban way, the Kirby way. But I think there are things about him that set himself apart from those two. In other words, he takes what what he got from them, but he applies it to the unique version of himself. I think down the road, he'll be a rock star head coach. But I've, I spoke to you before, and I'll say it again. I don't think you have to take large risk at a place like Texas A&M. You don't have, Mississippi State has to do that. Arkansas has to do that. A&M doesn't have to do that. So I go find a guy who's done it before, who's proven it as a major head coach. And you're right. When you look out there across the landscape, There is not that. And I don't, you can tell me, I don't know how much traction the West Coast guys have gotten, like Smith or DeBoer or or Fish or anyone like that. Um, Those are total blind spots for me. I don't know any of those guys personally. And I don't know how they would acclimate to the SEC way of doing things. They're quality football coaches, obviously, uh, but it takes a lot more than that to succeed in this profession, in this conference. So I don't know where that slam dunk candidate is. That's why even if you print money, it is not as easy as it sounds. To, well, let's just go hire a top coach and win. Well, everybody tries to do that, man. It's not that easy. How important in your eyes is it to get somebody in here soon, though, because of the talent that you do have? And you said you might be able to win next year or the year after. But in this new world of college football, people can be gone. And you got to have somebody that inspires kids to stay, inspires a recruiting class that's top 10 right now to stay with this uh, with their pledge to A&M. It's, it's important. It's not imperative, but it is important. Um, down the road, you know, you, you probably can't tell me the day on the calendar that Kirby Smart took the job at Georgia. Like, no one remembers that because he built a winner. So it doesn't matter if you waited till February. Like, if you wanted an NFL coach, it doesn't matter – in the long run, as long as you get it right, I'd much rather hire the right guy in January than the wrong guy in December, in other words. So yeah, short term, it does matter. But also we know another thing. We know that there are ways post-December to construct a roster on the fly that didn't used to be available to us. So it's not the end of the world 
if you don't have a guy in place by early signing day or beyond, I mean, we can we can do a lot of things in the sport we didn't used to be able to do, in other words. Talking to Josh Pate here on Tech Sags Radio. Josh, what, what do you make of the way they played Saturday? And I know they're playing Mississippi State. But that was a different performance, the way they went about their business. And I know you were, I think you were at the Penn State-Michigan game, right? Am I right about yep. that? Um, but just the fact that they they played so free on offense and they played differently even on defense, like the whole thing felt like Jimbo had already been removed and he had no clue. That was what I was surprised by. That game, that game reeked of a game that's played consequence free. I mean, that's like you act on the last day of school. If you're a senior, you just throw caution to the wind. Um, there's no concern about ramifications. Like, what are they going to do to me at this point? That's absolutely how that felt. That's why if I didn't know better, I would swear, oh, he must have been told Friday, hey, this is what's happening. And he said, all right, well, we're going to go out the way we're going to want to go out then. Uh, apparently, that wasn't the case. So I don't know. But I will say this. There was a there was a I guess a line of thinking out there that this makes A&M look bad because why would you fire a coach after he wins by half a hundred or something like that? I think it makes them look good because it reinforces the idea that they're resolute in their decision no matter what. And I, I know good and well, you guys have to have talked about that thing at LSU a couple of years ago, but nationally, I think people have forgotten they waffled on Orgeron and let themselves get backed into a corner and gave him a shot to beat A&M, actually, and get carried off the field and whatnot. And he was totally sure this was his last game. Well, then they keep him around. It happened with Miles, it happened with Orgeron, and they keep him around one year too long. A&M was not going to let that happen. And I think that makes him look good because you fire a guy after a win, it just proves we weren't beholden to the whims of every four quarters changing our minds. Along the same lines, how important is it important in your eyes to finish out this season um, with a bunch of wins, beating LSU with you know a TBD at coach and, and, and winning a bowl game and having nine wins considering all the changes. Does that even matter in today's college football with so much changing parts moving forward? Uh, Long term. So let me answer this twofold. If I'm an A&M fan, you better believe it matters because uh, every game matters. We only get 12 of them a year. Like it's, it's a college football game. Yeah, they all matter. There's a reason. There's a history. Uh, there's a juice between A&M and LSU. It doesn't matter if I'm on the sidelines. But in the grand scheme of things, no, it does not matter. Uh, because it, it's like, um, you know, you can go all the way back to when Bama hired Saban. Like they, they fired Mike Shula. They're on an interim basis. They, they're losing to like Oklahoma State. They did, I don't even think they made a bowl game the year before. And none of that really mattered. They went and got Nick Saban. And even in Saban's first year, David, they go seven and six. They lose to UL Monroe. No one cares about that. As long as you're in the process of getting it right. Like there's, a, there's another misconception out there in sports. And that is if you're watching on the screen, people think success just looks like this. And, and it's not like that. It's like this right here. It's like a, a steady climb through turbulence. Plane goes up, plane go down, up, down. But it's tracking in the right direction. And so if, if you're in the process of hiring the right guy and you lose by 30 to LSU in the process with an interim, it sucks that day. But two years from now, if come November, A&M's number three in the college football playoff rankings, no one cares about what happened at the end of 2023. No doubt about that. Um do you think Jimbo's going to coach again? I, I, I would have to know if he has the drive to, because uh, I think, I think there's going to be a time where he gets a little taste of this media world, like Mullen's getting right now, yeah. and realizes how sweet it is and how you're always right in this <laughs> line of work. And I don't, I don't know. Like I could see it again. I don't know if it would be major college football, but. I mean, certainly if, uh, if a G5 caliber program wanted a head coach with experience, yeah, I, I could easily see that. Um, but how much will he want it? Like, I don't, p- people say, well, if I had that kind of money, I'd never coach again. Money's not the motivating factor for a lot of these guys. If it was, they'd retire tomorrow. They're already financially set. Uh, it's, it's not the, for 99% of coaches I talk to, they don't, they care about how much they make, but it is not what fuels them. What fuels them is competition. And the one thing that we get him back on the sidelines is he ended his career in in failure. He ended being fired like most guys are. And how much does that eat at you? Because if it does, it doesn't matter if you got 15 figures in your bank account. You're going to coach again if you get the shot. Last thing for you. I don't think they're going to consider Lane Kiffin, but would you consider Lane Kiffin at Texas A&M? 
I wouldn't um, because I don't I don't think I need to take any kind of risk. I, look, let me let me rephrase that. There are some things some people care about that I don't care about that are going to be an issue if you try and hire Kiffin, just his past in general. Uh, I, I don't know how much that would matter to the A&M folks. But I will say, uh, you know, if you just care about putting quality product on the field, Kiffin has figured some things out now. If you look at some of the, the more advanced metrics, he's doing things they shouldn't really be doing at Ole Miss. I think they figured out NIL a little ahead of the curve. And they've done it because they have to be creative there, whereas you don't have to as much at a and I mean, you, you can play the game at the head table. I don't know if I would. Um, I don't think they will. I, I don't know. I, I would be probably 60, 40 any given day on that. It would depend on the other candidates that I knew I could have a shot at in the room. Josh, I appreciate you, man. I owe you a phone call for not radio just to check in on stuff. But thanks so much for making some time. I appreciate it, David.